Welcome to the Bold Goal Crusher podcast for anyone looking to stop letting life get in the way and start crushing bold goals. I'm your host, Sarah Mayer, and I'm thrilled to navigate this journey with you because it's time to start boldly achieving without working double time. So let's dive in. Hello, Bold Goal Crushers. I am super excited to introduce you to my guest and my friend today. I think you're really going to like her message. So today's guest helps those she works with to build resilience and face their challenges in a healthy and productive way. Sylvia Davis is a transformational speaker and the award-winning author of the book, Living a Parable, Finding Lessons in unlikely experiences. Her speaking style and determination led her to becoming one of only eight out of 35,000 people worldwide who entered the opportunity to compete in this year, 2023's Toastmasters World Championship of Public Speaking. Please welcome my friend, Sylvia Davis. Hi, Sarah. Bye, everybody. Hi. Thanks for having me. Thank you. I am just thrilled to have you on the show. I met you, I want to say, about a year ago, and I was captivated by your message. And then just watching your journey this spring from your first speech all the way to the World Championship stage was inspiring and exciting. Thank you. I, it was definitely a learning experience. Every step of the way was something new that was brought to the table. And I, I do remember meeting you and the help, especially towards the end that you were and the inspiration that you were. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. For those of you listening who aren't familiar with the Toastmasters International Speech Contest, I'd love for you to maybe share what that's all about so listeners can get a perspective of the scale of this. Okay. I joined Toastmasters in 2019. And when I joined, I didn't know that there was a contest. And at that point in time, uh, I was told that there was going to be this contest. There was, a, there was an international contest. And then there was also a humorous contest. The humorous contest didn't go all the way to the world stage. It was only the international. So I, me being me, I said, what do I have to do to put my hat in the ring for the international contest? I was told that there were a lot of filtering contests that had to be had. For example, I had to compete in my club level and I had to win there. And then there would be all of these other ranges that you would have to complete in order to win. But in 2019, as everyone knows, COVID hit in 2020. I didn't know that the contest was going on. I, I, I thought that it was the end, but there was a 2020 winner. So I decided to try again. Uh, in 2022 is when we started it up again for the 2023 competition. So I picked that up again, competed in the club level, and then you have to compete in the area level. And Sarah, I might need your help with this, remembering all the levels, but there's the area level. And then there is the, the division, district, the division, division level. And then there is the district. <laughs> so everybody, for everybody, these are all the levels that you have to compete in and win. And then, then finally, the semifinals. Yes, but finally go to regionals, and that was done through a video of the speech that I gave. But to answer your question, Sarah, it's, it's all of these levels that you have to compete and you have to win. And with every single time for me, the speech was revised because every single time with every single level, the competition gets more and more fierce. And I was doing the same speech, but I was changing it a little bit with each time because with each time that I did it and I worked on it and refined it, I got a little bit more feedback to make it a little bit better. Then in June, I got the notification that my speech had been selected, that I was one of the top two for the district and that I had been selected to compete in the Bahamas for, in the semifinals. So flew out to the Bahamas for the semifinals, but I had to be one of the top two in my semifinal in order to get my spot on the world stage. And I was one of the top two. So I got my spot on the world stage. And that's how they dwindled it down from 35,000 people across over 100 countries 
to just eight people. And spoiler alert, she was one of eight people on the world stage. And what's really interesting about this, she did the same speech over and over, had lots of practice, but the speech that you actually gave in the world championship of public speaking was a brand new speech. You had to write an entirely new speech for that. Time. And you know what? And I, I learned something about myself and about the process because I knew for months that if I made it to the world stage, it would require a new speech. I knew that, but I didn't work on one. And the reason I didn't work on one was because I thought, what's the likelihood of me making it that far? I, I just didn't, I don't think I had that confidence in myself. I, I prayed and I visualized it and all of that, but I also was like, I'm not going to spend this time working on a second speech that I may never have to give. And people were saying to me, they're like, look, you have a second speech prepared and you don't make it. You can use it the next time. I'm like, no, no. <laughs> I got other things to do. So when I got that email telling me, and it was in the end of June, and that competition for the whole stage was going to be in August. So that gave me a good month and a half to write another speech, memorize another speech, and get it to the caliber that I needed it to be. Whereas the speech that got me to the semifinals, I've been working on that since 2019. I, I had it in my back pocket for that long. And I knew it like the back of my hand. So that was definitely a learning experience. So I would want to say to anybody listening, if there is a chance that you can make it in your goals and your dreams and you're putting off something that you know you're going to have to do if you make it that far, do it. At least mm. start working on it. At least start preparing. I'm going to tell you right now, if I do compete and I am planning on competing again, I'm going to be working on two speeches. I'm not going to wait until the last minute to work on that second speech. I'm just going to have that belief in myself that I'm going to make it all the way and I'll be ready. Mm. And, and there's such a lesson in what you just said. You mentioned confidence. You weren't, you didn't have the confidence to think that you were going to get to that world stage. And our brains do this thing, like they're trying to protect us. So it was almost like protecting you from the fact that you may or may not get there. And, oh, it's fine. We don't expect to get there. So it's okay if we don't. But what what happened in your circumstance is you actually put off doing something in being in that protect, protection mode and that lack of confidence mode that you almost knew you should have worked on it. It's, hey, we might have to do this paper, but we're not going to work on it today because if we don't get there, it's time wasted. And I think that's so parallel to a lot of things when goals really are big and bold and seem unattainable. It's easy to say, oh, I really didn't want that or it wasn't really possible in the first place. Good thing I didn't waste that time working yeah. on it. And I think yeah. this time, should Lord willing, I make it at, to a certain point, I will start working on the second one. I, I won't wait. I, I really, at the very minimum, should have started working on the second one the minute I won, the minute I got submitted to regionals. I should have immediately started working on that second one just in case, but I didn't do it. I waited until I had confirmation that I was selected to go to the semifinals. And that, that was a mistake. I'm not beating myself up too bad because I still feel like my end product, what I did on the stage, my speech on the stage, I'm still very proud of it. So I'm not going to beat myself up too much. I really doubled down on it. I probably still spent as much time working on it because I was pouring my blood, sweat, and tears into it several hours a day working on it, which I probably would have done had I started working on it soon. Yeah. In hindsight's 2020, but it's also a little bit presumptuous to be like, I think as women, sometimes we don't want to say, oh, I'm already working on it because we don't want people to think we just assume we're going to get there or looking at athletes. Oh, I'm already practicing for the Super Bowl, even though they're not close to that. Sometimes people are like, oh, but that's a little cocky. I, I, I don't disagree with you thinking that might be how people how some people might see it, yeah. but that's the wrong way to look at it, in my opinion. Yeah. 
I really think that if you're a football player, you should be training like they're going to go to the Super Bowl. Me, if I do enter this contest again, I will be training as though I'm going to make it to the world stage. That's how we should think because it gives us hope. It gives us, it, it gets the wheels turning. It's a help. The other way of thinking that, oh, if I don't make it, at least I won't have wasted all of this time on this. Or if I don't make it, then that safety net sometimes does us a disservice. Yes, and, exactly. And I don't think, not I don't think, I don't don't care if someone thinks that it's cocky of me to prepare because it's not cocky to prepare. I, I don't believe, I believe it's better to prepare than yeah. to not be prepared. And I learned that firsthand. Yeah. So how exciting though, you gave the speech at the club, you won at the area level, you won at the division level, you won at the district level. Were you at all surprised? <laughs> I think the surprise came, now that might make me sound cocky, but I'm like, nah, I'm a child. I expected it. I knew I was, gonna... no, that might make me sound cocky, but yeah. So I, I was surprised, especially, I think that one you you were in seeing it, I believe, and I was in the hotel room, the one right before I uh, going to the regionals. So that that videotape, yeah. it was for gosh, what was it? It was like a conference or something in the di- in, the district. Yes, yeah. yes, and I couldn't. So I had another another competition that I was in that morning, and I knew I wouldn't be able to drive home. So I actually rented a hotel room so that I could be in both places, finish one competition and immediately go into the other. That was the one that I think that surprised me the, the most. No, that's not true. That was the first one that really was like, oh my God, I did it. It was getting the email telling me that I'd been selected for the semifinals. That was the one that, that surprised me. I had been, that was the toughest one because for every other contest, everybody, for every other contest, you find out immediately if you won or not. But for the one where my video had to be submitted, that was a weeks long, not a week, as, but weeks, plural. I had to wait weeks to find out if I was selected as one of the top two for the district. And I remember I had just sent out an email that day because I was diligently checking the Toastmasters website to see if names started to fill in because I didn't know what the process was. And then what happened was I had created a, a Facebook post and I said, hey, guys, because I saw names were starting to fill in, but no names have been filled in for our district yet. And I made a post and I said, hey, guys, pray for me. I need my name to show up in one of these two slots. But I, And I told everybody, I don't know when it's going to happen, but I need my name to show up. It, The word came to me 10 minutes after I made that post. Mm. 10 minutes after I made that post, I got the email saying, congratulations, Toastmaster Davis. You've been selected. I was like, I screamed and I, that, I don't know if that was a combination of surprise as well as joy, Mm -hmm. just joy. And this, this weight off of my shoulders, but then it immediately got put back on because I knew I had to now start preparing a completely different speech. Yeah. But, and figure out how to get to the Bahamas and all that stuff. That's a whole other thing. Yeah. It was, but what was yep. really cool about the process, I'm the program quality director, so I oversee, I oversaw all the contests. And I can't really root for anyone because my job is to oversee as the chair that district contest. But I remember seeing your speech early on and thinking, and I'm not a judge, so didn't have influence over that, but thinking this is one that can be on the world stage. And then to see you win at the district level and then to be able to actually support you. Once you got past the district level, I was able to help with some of your speech and and see the changes that you made over time and the refinements. And then to see the final thing, it changed throughout that whole season a, a great deal. It changed a lot. And part of that was because I, I, I have to give it to anybody who is listening and who might even be considering becoming a Toastmaster, do it. I've learned so much from being a Toastmaster and I don't want to go too off, too far off into the weeds. But one thing that I learned, and, and I shared this in the open house that I did last week about being a Toastmaster, 
a lot of people think that being a Toastmaster is all about learning how to be a better public speaker. And I'm sure a lot of Toastmasters will say, yes, that is what being a Toastmaster is. It's about, but my journey, what I've learned, it's not about being a better public speaker. It's about being an effective communicator. So whether you are talking to a group of people or whether you're talking one-on-one like I am with you right now, that's what Toastmasters has helped me to become, to help me to become a better communicator with, along with pathways and learning how to be a better leader and just learning how to get my point across in a timely manner, to stay on point, to get rid of those filler words and to sound like I know what I'm talking about, even if sometimes I might not. So that's what I've gotten from it. And then going back to your point about how much my speech changed, that was that another thing that I've gotten from Toastmasters is I can accept feedback a little bit easier than I used to be able to. When I did that first draft of what I was going to do on the world stage, I had the pleasure of doing my draft for another Toastmaster club in Phoenix and Ryan Avery, I think that's his name. Ryan was one of the Toastmasters. He was a world champion. I hope I got his name right. One of the Toast- I think he was in 2012, I think. But anyway, he was in that meeting and he asked me, I did my speech. I'm thinking, yeah, I did good. And my daughter was in the room too. She was off camera and she was listening. And uh, Ryan asked, he goes, do you, I have three levels of feedback. I can give you the the one that's going to be like, oh, you did awesome. That's great. Truthful, but very light. I can do number two, where it's a little bit more real, or I can do three, where I'm just going to give it to you. And I'm like, I need three. Um, Give it to me. Boy, did he give it to me. (laughs) To the point to where my daughter was off screen. She was taking off her earring. She was like, mama, I need you. She was ready to play. And uh, it it was like that. And not that he was mean. That was the case. He was just honest. And it was a level of feedback that I hadn't, and like I said, he gave me the choice. And with all of the Toastmasters clubs that I went to, everyone was very honest. Everyone was very honest. I think that the difference was he didn't pad it quite as much as I had been used to with softening the blow a little bit, but it was what I needed. And that's why the speech changed so much. That feedback made me really look harder at what I was preparing and, uh, I think that if it hadn't been for that, as well as all of the other Toastmasters clubs that I went to, because it was all of those clubs, and I said that on stage, they helped me, Mm -hmm. right? That speech was not my own. That speech was a compilation of all of the clubs that helped, that I went through and did it for, and who gave me feedback, said what confused them, said what they liked, said what they didn't necessarily like. That... I have all of those clubs to thank for getting me on that, for getting, for making me look like I belonged on that stage. Because oh, my you, de- final you speech, definitely belonged. Oh, thank you. My semifinal speech got me there. But mm-hmm. once I was on that world stage, oh my gosh, had it not been for the help of all of those clubs, because no one would have heard that speech before I got on the stage to do it because it was yeah. brand new. So I'm so thankful for all yeah. of that feedback, all of that help, all of that support. And I think you hit the nail on the head. There's that lesson in really learning how to take feedback, to be coached, to be coachable, but also to figure out how to stay authentic instead of being a robot. And it it was your speech. It was your message. And so how did you filter out all that feedback? Because I'm sure there was feedback where you're like, okay, great. Yes, implement. And then other feedback where you're like, that's not me. There was, I I had two rules. Number one, I, because there was a couple of times in my speech, I'm Christian. God has been a part of this journey for me, always has been, always will be. So there was a part of my speech where I mentioned a scripture and I was advised, oh, you know, maybe you might want to take that out. And I said, that's a hill I will die on. I'm not preaching. I knew that. And I wasn't trying to convert, but for some people, just even the mention, they would advise me against it. So that was something I was like, no, I'm not taking that out. 
the other rule that I had was if I heard the same piece of feedback three times, I changed it. Hmm. And that, and because there would be times where I, because you might remember my original opening, I talked about my cancer scare, yeah. but I had, I heard more than three times. So, oh, maybe you might not want to leave with that, or maybe that's that's been done to death, maybe, no pun intended, that's been done a lot, or it might, for whatever reason, I heard that feedback too many times. So even if I felt very strongly about something, if I heard it more than three times, the same thing, not necessarily a nuance of it, but the same thing, that was enough for me to be like, okay, I need to revamp this or change it. That's how I helped myself guide through. I love it. So and I had the privilege of seeing you on stage in the Bahamas at the semifinals. And I could not have been more excited when they announced that you were one of the two moving forward to the finals. And then I also had the privilege of seeing you in the finals. And I've watched your videos as well post-event. And I think you just should be so proud of yourself. Both your speeches had great audience feedback. They're laughing. They're following your journey along. And you just really crushed it. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, it was fun. I was <laughs> yeah, questioning my sanity every step of the way. Like, why am I wearing this again? This is like nerve wracking, but it was completely worth it. Completely. Yeah. And one of the things that happened, so spoiler alert, she did not win. But one of the things that happened from that is you shared that you had one of your greatest lessons and you shared this I believe it was on YouTube coming out a winner by losing on the world stage so tell me some lessons from that when I when they called the so, so the way that it works is they called the top three so there were eight of us they called the top three I heard the the third person call the number three I heard number two called and I just knew because of the other person, Jocelyn is her name. She's the one who actually won. When her name was not called yet, I knew that I hadn't beat Jocelyn. So I knew that I wasn't going to be, my name wasn't going to be called. And the minute my name wasn't called and the three had been ushered backstage, I went over to my husband because he was there with me. I went over to him and he, I saw the look on his face and I put my head on his shoulder and I whispered in his ear. I said, get me out of here. And because I wanted to, I, I didn't want to face anybody. I wanted to go, I wanted to cry. And he said in my ear, he told me back, he said, grace and dignity. So I knew that he wanted me to stay there because there were people coming over to congratulate me, people coming over to shake my hand. But I, uh, I wanted to leave. So about a couple of weeks later, I cried. I went back to the Airbnb and I cried. I never, I'm not a competitor. I'm not a competitor. So that was new to me to want something that bad and not attain it. That was new. And I didn't like how I was feeling. I was embarrassed. I to lose so publicly. I had so many friends and family watching as well. My husband had these long conversations with me and he was an athlete in high school and in college and, and he was a coach. So a lot of what I talked about in that video came from him. And I, I heard it from him and then I was experiencing it on my own. So there was grace and dignity. There was, he told me, he goes, as long as you know that you did your best, that you left nothing on the table. He told me that I only would lose if I quit because I was like, I'm going to lose again. I told some people there, I'm like, when they say, oh, you get it next year. I'm like, no, I didn't do this again. <laughs> uh, and then there were a couple of things that I learned on my own and that was to let others in. There were people who were trying to talk to me and I didn't, it, my pain was too great, but I didn't realize there were people still trying to learn from me. And I would have been doing them and myself a disservice if I ran from that. And the other thing is that I learned was to cling to my faith. There was a reason. There was a reason why I did not win. The, and speaking of reason, one thing that I did not share in that video that I've come to learn. So this is a, you, you get first scoop on this, Sarah. It's not in the video. And that is, I just said that there is a reason, but 
I am writing a book and in the book, I'm not going to word it that way. It's not, there is a reason. I'm going to say, create the reason. Because mm -hmm. there are some people who when something bad or some disappointment happens to them, they will wait for a reason to show itself. And I don't think that's a, a good way to handle it. I think that you have power to create that reason. Yeah. You can make the reason a reality is, okay, this happened to me and I didn't like it, but I'm going to make something good come from this. I'm going to be, this is why this did not happen. And for me, it's these lessons that I've learned. It's this book that I'm writing about it. Mm -hmm. That was the reason I, mm. I created it. I didn't wait for something to happen to make the reason. I'm like, you know what? I'm taking control of this. And on the other side of the pain, and I'm going to share something, another thing with you too. We all got a certificate basically saying you, you participated in the world championship of public speaking. And in my hurt and embarrassment and pain, I threw it away. Mm -hmm. I, in, in the Bahamas, I'm like, I don't want this. And I, I put it in garbage and I'm like, I don't, I said, I don't want it. Uh, my husband, though, so when I when we got back, it, it takes me a long time to unpack. Whenever I go somewhere, I'm like, take things out of the suitcase as I need it. That's just me. Buried beneath my clothes, I found it. My husband had taken it out of the garbage and he put it in my suitcase. And I have it framed right here. Oh, <laughs> I, mean. I love and it. I was so thankful that he did that because just shouldn't make decisions like that when you're when the wound is fresh yeah so I'm so glad that he got it because I read it and it says for participation in the world championship of public speaking and honestly that's not a participation trophy no. I, I earned that yeah, I I you earned did. my spot on that stage so it wasn't just me showing up at a particular date and time I had to win six different times to get there oh that's not a participation trophy and I'm so glad that my husband had the foresight to to pull it out of the trash and I'm, I'm embarrassed to, at the fact that I even threw it away but I that's where my mind was that I was so disappointed in myself and yeah. so upset and it just wasn't what I wanted at that point in time but I'm so glad that I had it and it's proudly displayed next to my other to my final <laughs> trophy yeah, there's so many lessons, I think, in when you have that big goal and you don't achieve it. I, I don't know if you know this, but I was, a, I still am, I ride horses, but I was very competitive growing up and I competed at the World Championship Horse Show twice. And one of my coaches always shared with me, similar to what your husband shared, that you have to leave everything on the table. And he would say, you can only control what you can control. You can control yourself, but your horse might be having a bad day, but you can't control the other competitors and the other horses and the judging, which can be somewhat subjective. Somebody might not like a black horse. Somebody might not like a chestnut horse and you can't control that. So you have to prepare and do your best and then be able to walk away from that goal and know that you did the best you can. And one of the biggest lessons was in goal setting. And I use this to this day. And he said, your goal should never be to win the world championship. And that when he first said it to me, I said, that sounds crazy. <laughs> and he said, you don't control all those other things. So your goal should be something that you can control, i.e., making sure that you have a flawless performance, you hit all your transitions, you have no mistakes, you get a certain number of points, you show up on a judge's card for something that is quantifiable. That should be the goal. The result is when you do all the training, you hit all your training hours and you do all those things, the result is you may win a world championship. Well, you know what? I like that. That Yeah. That because all of those other things my goal is to do my best at this yeah. my goal is to do this and hopefully my goals will end up 
with me getting this. Yeah. And I, I, I like that because I, I learned firsthand. It is very subjective uh, mm -hmm. on that world stage. I, I have no idea who the judges are. I got no feedback as to why I did not place what I could yeah. have done better, what I didn't do. I have my thoughts about where, what kept me off yeah. as being one of the top three. I have my thoughts about that, but I'll let you know. Yeah. And it's easier said than done. And you have no control over who the other competitors were, what their speeches were about and how well they did. In a different <laughs> field, it might have been a different result. And I take nothing from them. I yeah. take nothing from them. They were, I, the competition was stiff. It was, but it was supposed to be. Yeah. If it wasn't, then it would have been a bad thing. It was supposed to be stiff. Yeah. So. What a tremendous experience and lesson for you. And I love the takeaways that you have shared with others because there's so many lessons in winning and preparing to win. But oftentimes the real lessons come when you don't win. My, the message that I want to share in this book and probably my whole thought process, a lot of it revolves around being resilient. If you go to my website, you'll see resilience. And that's just my word because it, it blankets over a lot of different things. As far as fitness, you got to be resilient and how you take care of yourself and, and your fitness, how well you can bounce back from uh, health issues and things like that. You've got to be resilient in, for me, in your religion, because there, there are going to be people out there who are going to fight you on that. But there's got to be resilience also in winning and losing and honestly all of those wins didn't really teach me much mm -hmm. I, I didn't there were no lessons that came from that other than I got to get ready for the next one but losing that I felt that was much more emotional than, than the winning was it was a lot more thought-provoking than the winning was losing tested my character more than winning did. Losing, and that's part of that grace and dignity, losing well will show someone else looking at you so much more about your maturity level than how you handle a win will, in my opinion. Um, so that was huge to me. And let's face this also, knowing how to handle a loss effectively and coming out on the other side, well, is more beneficial than knowing how to handle a win. Because we are all going to lose at something, either a job, a relationship, a competition, something. We're all going to go for something and we're not going to hit our mark every single time. And how you handle those losses, it, it, it it's colossal. It could be life-changing. If you don't handle a loss right, you could spiral out of control. But if you handle a loss correctly, then you can not only come out a better person, but you can come out a winner later. Yeah, exactly. So I have a question. Will you be back? <laughs> we just talked about that in our club this past week. And I guess the competition start up again in December. Is that right? That is correct. You know what? California is a lot closer than the Bahamas. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, all right, you heard it here first. It sounds like she will be back. Yeah, there's, I'm supposed to put it this way. I'm going to put my hat in the ring. I'm going to compete at my club level and then let's see what happens from there. And hopefully I can make it all the way back up there and actually bring home bring home the, the trophy and not just the participation. Or it's not, that's not a participation. Well, it is. It is. Yeah. I love it. Now, if you're listening to the show and you're like, I absolutely need to connect with her, how might somebody find you and what might they expect? The, probably the best way to find me would be to go to my website, which is the Sylvia Davis. So T H E Sylvia S I L V I A D A V I S. So the Sylvia Davis dot com. And what you'll find there, you'll find more. It's a, the landing page because I do public speaking. So I do like to professionally speak. I like to speak on things. I, I do a lot of talking on black history, but what makes me different when I talk to companies about black history and to individuals is I give the lesson, but I like to not only talk about the historical facts, 
but how does knowing, what can we learn from this? Because there's lots of resilience built into Black history. There's a lot of resilience built into Black history. Like how did someone born into slavery, how did that person become a millionaire? How did that person build a business? How did that person find the will to live another day? There's so much in that those lessons aren't just for Black people. Those lessons are for everyone because we can all tap into that spirit of the human or that we can all tap into that power from the human spirit. So you would find that. Another good way to get in touch with me would definitely be to go to my Instagram page. Also, be Sylvia Davis. I, I'm on there. I try to be on there frequently. I definitely do reply to people and that's a lot of fun. But so yeah, those are probably the best ways. My website and then also the I YouTube channel, which is, yeah, if you just look for Sylvia Davis, you'll find me on there too. That's great. I hope everyone connects with Sylvia. It was such a pleasure seeing your journey and now talking about and, you know, unpacking that journey from afar. I'm very excited for you and what your future will, what will come of your future in your speaking career, not only on the stage, but throughout the messages that you'll share in your book as well. Thank you. And one other thing I forgot to mention, I, while I talk about resilience with Black history, it's it doesn't begin and end there. I like to expand it out. There's a fitness aspect to it. There's a religion aspect to it. So it's a lot of fun. So if you go to my website, you'll definitely see the different levels. Awesome. All right, everyone, connect with Sylvia. And just remember that you can crush your goals and everything that gets in the way. So let's get to it. Thank you so much for being on the show. I love it talking with you. You're just a breath of fresh air. (laughs) Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. All right. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the Bold Goal Crusher podcast, where we crush goals and everything that gets in the way. I always love to support my community. I look forward to seeing you crush your goals this year.